it's a great pleasure for me to be speaking again at the Airflow Summit. As I was saying, my name is Nathan, I'm a Principal Data Engineer at King. Hopefully you might know who we are, but if, if you don't, for the uninitiated, we make cross-platform mobile casual games, the most famous of that one being Candy Crush Saga. But we have many other games too, and you know, we have a, a fairly large user base of over 200 million players, uh, 200 million monthly players. Quick bit of history, King was founded in around 2003 in Sweden, and 2012 was when we had our big hit releasing Candy Crush Saga. And 2016, King was acquired by Activision Blizzard, and then maybe you heard that last year, Activision Blizzard itself was acquired by Microsoft. So today, King finds itself part of Microsoft, and more specifically, part of Xbox. But let's get into it a little bit. So let's talk just briefly a little bit about Airflow and Gen AI. You might have heard of it. Um, but now that uh, Pandora's box, I suppose, is not only open, but has been thoroughly smashed into smithereens, I think that business leaders all, uh, from all over are, are asking how these tools could be used in every single way of working and application that we deal with. Certainly that's the case at King. Everyone at King is being um, encouraged to use uh, uh, AI tools. So partly through our kind of, you know, being part of Microsoft and their relationship with OpenAI, we've you know, fortunate to have access to some of these tools. So, you know, using ChatGPT Enterprise for just general data assistance, using GitHub Copilot for coding assistance, and then also the actual OpenAI platform for building you know, deeper application integration. Right now, Airflow doesn't really feature any kind of native gen AI uh, features yet. There's a good talk, I think, on Thursday by Caxel and Ash, maybe talking around this area, so I'll definitely be going along to listen to that. But you know, that said, there's already you know, several LLM Airflow providers that are available to use. So there's already stuff that we can potentially do. And that got us thinking about, well, you know, when it comes to our data operations, how might we be able to use these tools to perhaps you know, run some of our pipelines more, more efficiently? And I guess specifically, could we try to improve our data ops through better failure analysis? So that kind of led us to what I've called this kind of air, airflow task failure diagnosis, which came about almost sort of out of a hack day type scenario. So we're familiar with this, right? So a task log, and in that task log, when something's failed, we've got our trace back, and we've got an exception uh, message here, which you know, may or may not be helpful to you. But could we do? Could we do more? Could we use a LEM tool to perhaps bring more context to this. So could we get it to you know, assess and describe the issue? Maybe identify and explain what actually happened, the root cause behind this problem. We also get it to suggest possible solutions for us as well. And maybe even rewrite some code for us. So you know, if we've given it some, given it some SQL and that's not, that's not, not right, could it you know, also rewrite that for us and help us out? So this is what we, this is what we tried to do. And how we went about this was we're going to use the AI platform here, because that's what's available to us. We invoke this, this diagnoser through a failure callback. So when a task fails, we'll do something here. We'll collate together a bunch of extra information. You know, we'll, get, we'll get that exception message. We'll get our DAG code. If it's you know, from SQL, we'll pull, we'll pull that together. We'll package that up, send that off to our model, get the results back. And then output that out back into back into the task logs, or you know maybe through alerting channels as well, so Slack, PagerDuty as well. So you know, if someone gets, gets woken up in the middle of the night, they've got that context there as well. Just talk briefly a little bit about kind of the OpenAI platform. I'm not going to go into too much too much detail here. There's basically two ways that you could attempt to do this. One would be with the chat completion API. The other with the assistance API. I, I mean in in, in summary, the chat completion API, if you needed just a very simple conversational agent without really a need for it to remember in past interactions, you'd probably do that. But my initial version of this was based on the chat completion API. But the assistance API much gives you much more advanced features for better application integration. So a quick word on the, on the assistance API. So it enables us to build AI assistance within applications. The assistant that we create has instructions that we give to it. It can leverage the models. We can enable certain tools within it and give it extra files that we want to, it to use in order to respond to user queries. 
I think there's basically three tools that you can enable on, a, on, a, on an assistant currently. A code interpreter, which allows, enables it to write and run Python code. Uh, a file search tool, which basically means you can augment, augment the, um, the model with uh, extra knowledge. And then a function calling tool, which enables you to actually describe custom functions for the assistant to use. So as I said, we, yeah, we, we create an assistant object. That's our purpose-built purpose API. There's a thread object as well, and a thread is a you know, conversation session between an assistant and a user. That thread will store messages, and these threads persist over time and can be subsequently added uh, to. So a message object is created by an assistant or a user. That message can include text, images, other files, and all these messages are stored on the thread as a list. Uh, a run object is an inv uh, invocation of an, ass of an assistant on a thread uses its configuration and, and the message to perform tasks by calling models and tools, and will we'll then append messages back to that thread. And if we wanted to see a detailed list of the, all of the steps that took as part of the run, then there's a, a run step object as well. Okay, so we've run a task. That task has failed. It hits our callback function, and this is where we want to start building the extra context that we're going to need. So. Um, when, when it hits out into our callback function, we can use the DAG context to pull together some extra information. So we'll pick the, pick the DAG ID, the task ID, we can pull out the um, task exception. We can use the serialized DAG model to uh, identify where the file location is. And we also pull out the SQL. You notice here this is very specific to just BigQuery and, and, and that operator here, but just the world that we are working currently. So we'll package that information together, just put it in a JSON object, and then call our actual diagnose function. So we want to create our assistant. If this is the first time that we are that uh, something has failed, we, we need to create our, create our assistant. Otherwise, we might want to modify it if we're changing our instructions. In an ideal world, we wouldn't be creating this assistant as part of the callback, but this is just how it works currently. So when we create that assistant, we need to you know, give, it some, give it some arguments. First will be the instructions, i.e. the prompt on how we want this system to behave. We'll specify a model that we want to use. In this case, we're going to use GPT-40 Mini. This is cheaper and faster than GPT-40, but smarter and cheaper than GPT-3.5 uh, Turbo. We'll set the temperature. Now, LLMs, of course, are non-deterministic by nature, but we, can, you know, we have some dials that we can use to dictate how how deterministic we want it to be. I've dialed this right down, but even this will still give you some differences from one run, one run to the next, potentially. And we'll also enable a tool, in this case, the file search tool, which will give us the ability to use any files that we have loaded. So we've created our assistant. Oh, sorry, just before I go on to the next bit. As, we've, as people have mentioned, you know, the, how well the, the quality of the response is based quite a lot on the information and the prompt that we give it. So, you know, we want to we want our prompt to be quite clear and precise in, in what we want it to achieve. State the question or topic. You know, give an example of the type of response that we might might expect, and you know, give it very clear instructions or constraints about how we want it to behave. So, a very poor prompt would be tell me about dogs. A good prompt would be provide detailed information on the different breeds of dogs, focusing on temperance size and common health issues. So, the prompt that we created. For this, looks a bit like this. So we specify a role, task value diagnoser, objective to diagnose FO task values based on providing details and suggest solutions. A set of instructions, you know, it, we're telling it what it will receive, you know, JSON object containing these three things. Gives it some very clear tasks. One, to, you know, assist and describe the issue. Two, identify and explain the cause. Three, provide potential solutions. And if it you know, contains SQL, maybe try and rewrite it as well. And then we specify the output format as well. And if anyone's curious, yes, I did actually use LM as well to actually refine the prompt <laughs> that I initially created. OK, so we've got our assistant. We've given it those instructions. The next thing we want to do is we want to upload the DAG code. So we've identified the file location. Now let's upload, upload that file. That file will get automatically you know, passed and chunked, and it will create and store the uh, embeddings. After that, we can, we can create a thread. And onto that thread, we'll create a message which takes the role of the user. And the content will be our JSON dictionary of the exception and, and, and such like. And we'll also attach the, the ID of that file that we, um, that we just uploaded. And then after that, we'll create a run that will use the model and the tools to generate a response. 
And as, as I mentioned, pop that message back onto the thread as, as an assistant message. OK, so then we've run it. And then all that's left for us to really do now is get those messages back from the thread. And we'll then just clean up that response a little bit. There's a little quirk here. That we ask for a JSON object, and it gives you a JSON object back. But that JSON object has actually got these like markdown tags on the end at the moment. So you've got to strip those tags off before we actually get a JSON that we can return. I think that might be a little quirk of GPT-4 and many other So we've, yeah, we've got our diagnosis back. There's a JSON. We just return that. And then we can just write that, that diagnosis information back out into our task log and Slack or pages messages. So that's broadly how, how the diagnoser kind of works. So let's have a look at it a little bit in, in action. So here we've got a, a task here where we're just creating an empty BigQuery table. All I've really done in this one is just make a subtle typo in the data set ID. Um, so that runs and that, and that fails. And then what do we see? Well, we've seen our, we've got our generic, well, generic our Google error message there, which tells us that it was, it failed because the data set was not found. Okay, so it's maybe not the most complicated error that we you know, need an AI to try and help us understand what's gone wrong, but it's telling, you know, our diagnosis is saying that it failed due to not found error and the root cause is that the data set does not exist. Okay, well, as I said, not that, not massively helpful, but it's doing the things that we asked the assistant to do. Let's look at a few more uh, examples then. Um, uh, again, here we are just trying to create an, uh, an empty table. Um, this task failed. And our error said that the, spilled, the field specified for partitioning cannot be found in the schema. OK, so if you're familiar with you know, databases that use partitioning or BigQuery, this is you know, not that complicated an, an, an error. But you know, I don't know, maybe if you're first line support for something and you're not that, not that technically savvy, this might not mean much to you. So what does our diagnosis say? Well, it says that the, the task failed due to a missing field in the scheme of partitioning. The root cause is that the field specified by time partitioning date does not exist in the schema. The schema defines the field DT as date, but the partitioning field is incorrectly specified as date. And we can see that if we look at the, the task there. Whoa. OK, so yes, we specified DT and time partitioning field as date. So again, not quite complicated, but the diagnosis gives us a bit more, a bit more context and it's a bit, a bit more specific. Let's take a look at another one with a SQL error. The eagle eyed amongst you might see the, the problem, but the error is so that it's the name matching signature for operator equals for argument string in 64 supported signature n equals n. E equals n e. Okay, maybe that's a bit more obtuse, I think, but our diagnosis says that there's a type mismatch error in the where clause. Queries are to compare a string with an integer, not allowed. Maybe some suggested fixes are to uh, maybe use cast or safe cast in this, in, in this case. Again, a contrived example perhaps, but getting a bit more specific to the actual cause of the problem rather than that, this error. Let's take a look at another one here, uh, an operator which is taking data from a HTTP endpoint and uploading it into Google Cloud Storage. All, all we get here is just a very generic 400 error. Let's have a look at the error in a bit more detail. Well, this is saying that the root cause of the failure is likely due to a typo in the endpoint, endpoint URL. So, the endpoint is set to some, is set to blah forward report instead of blah forward report. So what's it done there? It's, it guessed that our endpoint should have had report rather than report there. So again, going for something pretty generic and not really that helpful to uh, something a bit more uh, helpful to us. Um, let's take a look at another one here. We've got another four hundred error, and we've got a URL here, but I'm not entirely sure what the problem is. What does our diagnosis say? Well, it says that the, the error is caused by an, an invalid or missing company ID, ID parameter in the API request URL. You can see that that is indeed the case. What it's maybe suggesting, I think the second one is the most interesting one. It says validate the company ID values retrieved from the get companies task to ensure that they're not empty or null. So in this example, what we've got is a task which is using you know, dynamic partitioning mapping to expand upon the company ID value based upon the results of a previous task. So that's quite good. It's telling it's, it's gone from gone from that error to maybe telling us that maybe what we want to do is look at the actual task previous to this, because that might be the cause of the, the of, of the problem here. Let's have a look at another one, another error just saying bad in 64 value 7.1.36. This 
a typecasting error. It says that SQL query attempts to cast a version string that contains non integer characters. Suggested fixes here maybe modify the SQL query to handle non integer version strings appropriately, such as extracting the major version number. And it's, you know, we re produced some rewritten SQL for that query where it's, you know, wrapping that. That, that cast and it read it to extract, to extract the, the major number from, from the version. One more, again, another single query where we've got a, a array index one is out of bounds. I mean, this one you might have to troubleshoot it, but it looks like there's an issue with some data in here. The root cause of this suggests that the error indicates that the split function is returning an array with fewer elements than expected. Um, just system fixes, uh, maybe. At a condition, or maybe use a case statement to handle cases where the split does not yield expected number of elements. Again, it rewrote the SQL for this one. So that, that third uh, column, it applied a case just to check on the length of the array before then trying to uh, cast it out. Last example. In this example here, all we get is a very generic Python type error. The non type object is uh, not iterable. And the result of that, unfortunately, the actual the root cause is, is quite generic as well. It just, it's just telling you that it's trying to iterate over a non-type object. And the reason for this is the fact that um, the traceback, uh, from what I understand, looking at the FO code, is kind of thrown away immediately. So we don't have that available to us in order to provide that as extra context to the, to the model for it to diagnose. I think that if we did have that available, we could start to get diagnosis, which gets below just like the DAG code and then into the like, the operator and underlying kind of airflow code as well. So yeah, just to summarize briefly, this, as I said, this was a kind of experiment, I think, which came out, I say, more or less from a hack day type scenario. And you know, in that respect, I think it works. It does, it does what we were asking it to do. Um, hopefully, hopefully you've seen that it can provide you know, clear and specific answers in some cases. It's something that we do kind of run in live currently. From a personal perspective, this was a great learning experience because I'd not really interacted with kind of LM outside of just using you know, chat GPT in a browser. And it was enabled me to you know, provide some contribution opportunities. The open AI provider was pretty sparse when I started looking at it, but it contains a lot more stuff in there now. You know, on, the, on the downside, you know, maybe common areas can be pretty uh, self-explanatory. Um, as, as I mentioned, not having these error traceback limits can, can limit deeper diagnosis. Creating and modifying the system and uploading these files as part of a callback is not the desirable way we'd um, really want to do this. Um, obviously, we've, I've built this just for kind of open AI. It's not immediately compatible with um, other LLMs. And it's not free. Um, just to give a quick bit of context, the first example that I used GPT-4 would cost about two cents. GPT-4 mini is about a fraction, of a fraction of a cent. So not your usage might vary, but hopefully this only happens when things actually go wrong, which is hopefully rare. All right, well, that's, that's all I want to say. Thanks very much for your time, and uh, yeah.